for the riots, we all witnessed how you were and how outraged you were by the death of Freddie Gray. Why is it that it seems as though you were more outraged by the death of Freddie Gray than you are outraged and angered and upset and leading rallies over the death of 30 plus people who died from homicides this month? So again, you can choose to be selective about my track record if you'd like uh, to mischaracterize, but it's just not true. I've led um, When was the last rally that you led about the deaths of all these people this month? And Are you planning one? Yeah, uh, boy, he got her good. He got the mayor of uh, Baltimore good. Uh, Jeff Reuter, spokesman of the St. Louis Police Officers Association and former member of the Missouri House of Representatives, uh, joins us. And, Jeff, good to talk to you again. Um, that is so true. Uh, I mean, about 40 murders, 38 murders in the month of May in Baltimore. And, in my view, virtual silence from the, uh, the, the, the powers that be in that city. It is true, Steve, and we've got politicians uh, just like that here. I mean, uh, you can take the worst neighborhood in in uh, urban Baltimore or urban St. Louis, and there still are way more law-abiding citizens living in that neighborhood than there are criminals. Uh, and I don't understand for the life of me how politicians uh, who represent those areas continue to stand with the criminals uh, rather than the crime victims uh, that, that live in their district, and particularly black folks who are disproportionately the victim of crimes and violent crimes, uh, to, to uh, turn your back on them in favor of uh, standing up for folks that are really I mean, criminals. Freddie Gray, Michael Brown, I mean, there's no other word for them. At, at, well, certainly Michael Brown, uh, and Freddie Gray, the, the arrest apparently was legitimate, uh, but Michael Brown, certainly uh, no, no question about that. Uh, let me read you something that the uh, Baltimore Police Union chief uh, said, uh, that criminals have become empowered and that uh, cops are more afraid of going to jail than getting shot. And that's why maybe we're seeing not a slowdown, but uh, a lessening of the aggressiveness, shall we say. Uh, I, I can't blame them. No, and it's a, it's a phenomenon that... that uh, isn't new to Baltimore. I mean, uh, you saw the same thing in New York a few months ago. We've experienced the same thing here in St. Louis, uh, Cincinnati uh, in the early 2000s, L.A. in the early 1990s. It's called depleasing, and it, it really describes what happens. I mean, and it's not some organized, conscious effort to, uh, to, to slow down uh, police work. It's just the, a natural reluctance uh, to, to do your job when you're under constant fire and and you really don't know what the right way to do it is in the face of all this unwarranted criticism is. Well, the Washington Post had a story out, uh, fatal police shootings in 2015 approaching 400 nationwide. Uh, if you go on to look at the uh, story, 80% of those people wound up having weapons, uh, lethal weapons on them. So if you take away 80% of, of 300 and, uh, what did I say, 400 or 385 as it really is, uh, you're left with, uh, nobody wants to kill anybody, but you're left with a much lesser number, obviously. And uh, the story gets even lesser uh, uh, spectacular. If you read further, 16% of them had what, what turned out to be toy guns. So, I mean, right. you know, I mean, it's, so where's the story? Why did they write the story for? Well, because they're, they're manufacturing a, a new um, reality. And, uh, you know, they, in, the, in the stories that I've seen, uh, much to my chagrin, they call, they call this police violence or police murder. Yeah, and yeah. This, is, this is guys trying to stay alive themselves when they're, when they're being attacked uh, by people who, in most cases, are armed. And even the cases where they're unarmed uh, either have a toy gun or, or engage in some sort of, uh, non-compliance. Right, um, resistance, non-compliance, right, and, right. and 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 this this fiction of unarmed. I mean, you don't know until you cuff a guy. I think I've said this to you every time you're on. Until you cuff a guy, until you search him, you don't know he's unarmed. If he's threatening you and he's abusive to you and he's resisting, you assume he's armed. Right, and particularly when when he's hiding his hands, right, uh, or he's got his hands in his waistband, which our guys deal with all the time. I mean. To, to Jeff, me, Jeff, the, Jeff, the Jeff I got it. I'm up against the clock, but it's always great to talk yeah. to you, sir. We'll talk to you soon. You bet, Steve. Thank you. More of the show, folks. But first, Rick Unger previews tonight's Daily Wrap, which follows this show immediately. Don't go away. Here's Rick. 
Thanks, Steve. Tonight on The Wrap, we'll look up into the sky and ask, is it a bird? Is it a plane? Well, it turns out that it is a plane and it belongs to the FBI who may be circling your city collecting data you may not want the government to have. We'll take a deep dive into the newly disclosed FBI flight surveillance program and its impact on you. Then we look at Hillary Clinton's sinking poll numbers and ask whether the Clinton campaign has hit the wall before ever really getting started. And does President Obama have it right when he says that he's made the United States the most respected nation on the planet since arriving in the Oval Office? The Daily Wrap panel takes on all this and more tonight, immediately following The Malsberg Show, and we hope you'll join us.